Welcome to Unaborted with Seth Gruber. Thank you so much for tuning in today. Hey, we have a special episode for you today from a very special event that happened last week in Thousand Oaks, California. But before I jump into that, if you haven't listened to this show yet, or if you've been listening to it and haven't given us a rating and review, please do that. We're really beginning to reach more people. The downloads on this show every week is really increasing, and that's encouraging in, in a time when the political winds are not in favor of the pro-life movement, and we need to equip and train and raise up and passion the next generation and the church to end the holocaust of abortion and to save these children and to get rid of this scourge on our country 48 years and 63 million aborted unborn children so go ahead and give us five stars uh, leave us a review let us know what you think and uh, share the podcast with a friend eh, maybe a pro-choice friend and then have conversation about that episode over coffee this is from an episode uh, this is from an event we had recently three days ago in thousand oaks california at my new home church god speak calvary chapel and we're fighting back here. We're fighting for the state of California where the church has abdicated their political role to promote righteousness and restrain evil uh, insofar as we can during these dark times. And so this was a meeting and a rallying call and a training event for the individuals who attend my home church to equip them to stand in the gap on behalf of the pre-born, our pre-born neighbors, God's image bearers. And we talk about the pillars of this pro-life ministry that we're building at God's Peak Calvary Chapel. So this is a little bit of a local window into what I, you, you're the host of this show, is doing to fight for life and liberty and the soul of this country in Thousand Oaks, California. And I think it'll bless you because this is something you can bring to your church. As I mentioned to you, I partner with Love Life out of Charlotte, North Carolina, where they're working to put a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the country, which would bankrupt the abortion industry in a matter of years, and the politics would soon follow. Our goal is to present the hope of the gospel and the help of the local church to broken women and families who have reached such a low point in their life that they have rationalized paying a hitman to tear the limbs off of their own child. That's what we're building here. You can do that in your community as well. So here is a special episode training, gathering of pro-life believers, of individuals who have other full-time jobs, but they're putting their faith out there and they're being willing to adopt personal responsibility to end the scourge of abortion. Buckle up. Here we go. Good evening, guys. How are you? Thank you guys for coming out. You look beautiful, as always. It's really good to see uh, faces and not masks. It's wonderful to see your smiling faces back at me, and it's wonderful to be here with you. Um, some of you may have been here on Think to Do Human Life Sunday. Uh, Charlie Kirk actually preached that morning, and I preached in the evening, and Rob was gracious to give me that opportunity as the church actually canceled on me last minute in, in San Diego and rescheduled me. And, and so it was good to be here with you. And I mentioned then that I just wanted to thank you guys for welcoming me and my family so graciously. Uh, this church is about, I think about, we get about 1,500, um, 1,700 on the high through here on a Sunday. Obviously, God Speaks growing a lot um, in the last, uh, well, it's almost been a year now, huh? Since this craziness. Um, and, and that's been wonderful and beautiful to watch from afar. And now from the inside, um, having been invited um, so ver vociferously and uh, relentlessly um, by, by Rob. Um, but this is not a large church if you compare it to other mega churches. The only reason I say that is to say this, the outturning here tonight is significantly greater than you would ever get at Saddleback Church for a pro-life informational meeting. Not to name names, but uh, <laughs> I mean, and that, that's a sobering reality. So I just wanted to say that. I wanted to thank you. And I do attribute so much of the obedience of this church on life, on liberty, on being watchmen and noticing the times we're in and responding appropriately to the leadership and the pastoral care of this church. And many of you came here in search of that, but many of you were discipled into that correct way of thinking, that orthodoxy requires orthopraxy, that, that faith actually requires action. Um, and as someone who's done this for almost a decade, like it's hard to say without breaking up, but I've never been so welcomed, so encouraged by a pastor, by a pastoral team, by an elder board, or by a congregation, um, except for maybe Jack Hibbs and, and, and Rob. So thank you guys so much for coming out tonight. And uh, 
you know, it's in the small things that the rot grows, um, but that rot has increased a hundredfold in our country um, in the last several months. And if we don't begin contending, um, our right to preach the full counsel of God will be taken away. And you're seeing that happen in Canada right now. But the reason I say all that is to say that it starts with life. Because if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any other rights right. You wonder why your liberty to run your businesses in accordance with your best judgment, to worship, to freely associate where you choose, is being compromised because the very politicians who don't protect your liberty have refused to protect the right to life of you when you were in the womb. And they've been doing that for 48 years. You wonder why nearly no BLM activists got arrested or charged for burning and looting and burning cities to ashes? I thought we had natural rights to property in America. Let's see, if you don't get the right to life right, you won't get any of the rights right. And Jack Hibbs told me once on his program when we were sitting down that if we turn from this in our country, and if we as a church takes back our responsibility to end this evil and to save the unborn and to make it illegal, yes, to pass laws against killing the unborn, it could be that God would have mercy on this land and we would be spared from the drunk drivers driving this American experiment 100 miles an hour into a tree if we turn from this issue. I want to share just a quick sort of historical lesson with you, and then we have a special guest for a portion of the evening um, who will be here digitally with us. Many of you know the story of Oscar Schindler. Many of you have seen the film, Schindler's List. Some of you maybe have even read the book, uh, Schindler's List. If you haven't seen the movie, uh, spoiler alert, um, but I, I assume most of you know his story. Oscar Schindler was a very rich businessman and entrepreneur um, during the Nazi regime. And I don't know if you knew this, but he was actually a member of the Nazi party. So he actually walked around with the golden pin that identified him as a member of the Nazi party. But God woke him up and got a hold of his heart, broke his heart and boiled his blood at what was happening to his Jewish brothers and sisters as they were being rounded up like cattle, experimented on and given showers, what today you might call reproductive health care, the euphemisms of bigots, right? So he began to get woke to the horrors of what were being committed against his Jewish brothers and sisters. And so Oscar Schindler actually began to exhaust his great net wealth, net worth and wealth and give it all away to trade money for lives. And he made that exchange without thinking about it. So he began to purchase Jews off of the Nazi death camp lists and employ them in his factories to hide them from the Nazis. And it's estimated that because of his sacrifices at the end of the war, he had saved over 1,000 Jewish men, women, and children from a Holocaust bent on their eradication and destruction. And if you've seen the film, right, played by Liam Neeson, right, who does an incredible job, the announcement rings out that the war has won, right? And he's standing here kind of in the center circle, surrounded by all of these Jewish men, women, and children who owe him their very lives. And they start celebrating, of course, goodness gracious, this war was fought to help stop their butchery. And they're celebrating that the Allied troops have won. But Oscar Schindler just stands there and he starts weeping. He starts crying. And you kind of wonder, what's going on here? I mean, shouldn't you be happy? And his, his brother, his friend approaches him and says, what's wrong? And he says, I could have saved one more. And he looks at his fancy car. The, one of the last things to his name, because he had given it all away. And he says, my car? <laughs> Why did I keep this? See, I could have sold this, and I could have saved 10 more. And then he looks at his little golden pin that still identifies him as a member of the Nazi party, and he says, my pin? My pin? This is gold. I could have sold this and saved three more. At least one more. And his friends join around him and hug him and embrace him and say, no, brother, we love you. But all he can say through tears down his face is, I could have saved one more. And you know, this was coming from a man who went to the wall to love his neighbor, yeah? 
who's broke at the end of a war because he wanted to trade money for lives. Few of us can say that we've sacrificed as much. So the question that echoes from his time to our times today is this, do we take our Holocaust in 2021 as seriously as Oscar Schindler took his? And if we do, if we truly do, then there's something we can do tonight. There's something we can commit to begin tonight. There's something we can do in this city this year to show that we are just as eager to give it all away, to trade our wealth, our energy, our comfort in exchange for the eternal souls of human beings who are being knit together in their mother's wombs at the only locations where we know innocent human beings are scheduled to die. Now, you know who I am because I've been on the live stream probably more than anyone else because that's how pro-life your pastor is. I preached here on November 1st, three days before the election because Rob looked me in the face and said, no issue is more important than this right before an election. But you may not be familiar with the ministry that I'm partnering with and, and, and an ambassador for, and it's right there on the screen, Love Life. Love Life is a ministry out of Charlotte, North Carolina. They began five years ago today. Isn't that cool? And a certain man got woken up to the horrors that were happening in America. And you're going to hear from the vice president today in a little bit. So he left his successful business as an entrepreneur to begin saving innocent human beings from a Holocaust. So what Love Life does is they help activate, equip, wake up the church of Christ, the bride of Christ in America as a united front with the goal of putting a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the country, offering the hope of the gospel and the help of the local church. Yes, we want to save these human beings who are scheduled to die immediately, but we also want to share the gospel with their parents. This is an evangelistic opportunity. It's both and because whose soul is more ready for the gospel than a man and woman who are in such a low, scared point in their life that they have actually rationalized in their mind, paying a hitman to dismember their child. Yeah, their heart's ready for the gospel. So that's what Love Life does, and they have changed the spiritual climate of that city. And you're going to hear a little bit from Josh Capps, their vice president here shortly, but I just want to make sure that you're aware of who this ministry is. The reason why I'm partnering with them is because I think that they're doing everything perfect. So I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. Okay. Politically they're there with us, but they're not waiting for the politics to begin saving savable babies now. And if we accomplish this goal, friends of putting a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the country, we would bankrupt the abortion industry in a matter of years and the politics would soon follow. And I think what Jack Hibb said would be correct. It may be that God would have mercy on this country in every other way because we would have turned from this Holocaust and butchery. So that's who Love Life is. And you're going to hear more about them today. So we are creating a Love Life chapter here and we're going to take back our responsibility in this state to stop the genocide of abortion. And we want to be a light on a hill, a shining light on a hill for this state and the still silent shepherds in this state who can't be bothered to preach against the dismemberment of human beings in a womb that our savior once entered human history in and showing what a true Christian witness looks like. Remember, I can't vote for Trump because I'm my witness. You know, what would be a powerful way to elevate your witness as Christians in this country saying we ended the genocide of abortion and every woman and father who kept their child will tell you that they're glad they're not pro-choice and they're glad that there were Christians on the sidewalk that day when they were about to walk into an appointment to kill their child. That would change the witness of the church. And I believe thousands would be saved in the meantime. So why don't you go ahead and shortly here, welcome Josh Caps. But before we do, we want to show you a short video of what the crescendo of five years of this type of faithfulness has resulted in, in Charlotte, North Carolina. Let's play this. Church, what got started here five years ago is now spreading across this nation and around the world. We declare life over every person that will be dry. 
alive in this place today. We pray right now for those that are in this place that are making decisions of life and death. God, we speak life right now. We're not waiting on politicians to change the culture. The church of Jesus Christ can change the culture towards love and towards life. I've called you to the least of these. I've called you to be a voice to the voiceless. Lord, thank you so much for the opportunity that you have given us, that you have entrusted us to be here, to be that light that you've called us to be. This morning we gather in Charlotte, but they're gathering in Greensboro right now. They're gathering in Raleigh. They're gathering in New York City and four new cities, Bronx, Fayetteville, Boise, Idaho, Savannah, Georgia. And let me tell you that this is just the beginning, church. This is just the beginning. they save her life, but they save mine too. So join us in welcoming Josh Capps, the Vice President of Love Life. Hey, good evening. Josh, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, tell us a, a quick little teaser story about that uh, baby Nazareth we just saw dancing on the stage. Yeah, you know, her story is incredible. Uh, there was a Christian witness outside the abortion clinic the day that her mom pulled up. She cracked her window just enough that one of the counselors could hand literature through the crack in her window, she took the booklet into the, uh, into the waiting room and she started reading it in the waiting room. The Lord used a Bible verse in that booklet to convict her. She walked out. After Nazi was born, she had her baby dedicated on the land that we own right next door to the abortion clinic by our local pastors. And uh, this past year, she was there on stage, as you just saw, uh, dancing before the Lord. And uh, the church is still walking with uh, that family, still discipling her, still taking her through some very difficult challenges right now. Wow. And uh, just one of many amazing stories of the church. When the church shows up, God shows up. Wow. That's beautiful. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, Josh, I think we got a couple people that came out tonight. So... Uh, I hear it. I hear it. There's a good, good applause there. I'm excited. I wish I could see everybody's beautiful faces. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you for joining us digitally. Um, I want you to share with us and everyone here tonight, Josh, just a little bit about the history of Love Life. Just get a sort of a, a crash course overview of what God did in Charlotte um, five years ago and also um, how he grabbed your heart and how you got involved with the ministry. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, ironically, Love Life started five years ago today. Uh, we were not uh, founded by a pastor. We were actually founded by a Christian business owner uh, who was invited by another business owner to a meeting. Uh, he didn't tell him that the meeting was in front of the abortion clinic. And, uh, and so uh, uh, Justin uh, Reeder is our founder and president. He's our number one volunteer and uh, his life was absolutely interrupted that day as, as he saw the, what he calls the tragic truth of abortion in our city. Uh, at the abortion clinic here in Charlotte, there's four in the city, but the main one is the largest in the Southeast. They do about 150 to 200 abortions a year. I'm sorry, a week uh, wow. at this one facility. And it's a privately owned business. It's the only service that they provide. We estimate that they have killed in their history over 100,000 human beings at this one facility. And Justin's heart was really gripped that day, not only by the tragic truth of abortion, Seth, but also by a lack of the presence of the people of God right. that were actually living as if people were dying. Right. And uh, so in a season of prayer and fasting uh, through the book of Nehemiah, the Lord gave Justin a strategy for what is now Love Life. Hmm. And so the mission of Love Life is to unite and mobilize the church 
to create a culture of love and life that will result in an end to abortion and the orphan crisis. Wow. We're creating a culture where men and women stop running to the local abortion clinic for the answers, and instead they run to the local church. And we're actually seeing that happen. And we believe that the church is uh, the, the, the key instrument. It's God's plan A for changing the culture. Politicians are downstream. They follow culture. There is an element to where legislation can help shift culture. But Jesus said to us as his followers, you are the salt of the earth. You are the light of the world. You have the keys to the kingdom. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. And so we know this is a spiritual issue. And the Lord has given us spiritual weapons. And so the strategy that the Lord gave to Justin was uh, to do a 40-week journey of hope where we host a peaceful prayer walk outside of the abortion clinic in Charlotte here. Uh, and we walk churches. We ask churches just adopt at least one of those 40 weeks. And we're going to take you through four steps, which is based out of the book of Nehemiah. Hear, pray, go, and connect. So on the Sunday of a church's adoption week, the pastor preaches on life. Church collectively uh, prays and fasts on Wednesday. Then on Saturday, is a, it's a peaceful prayer walk. We have a code of conduct. We don't allow people to engage with anyone involved with abortion. We have people who are trained to do that. And then at the end of the prayer walk, we mobilize people to ongoing ministry. And so, Seth, my story I started as a partnering pastor. I was invited to a, a one-hour journey. It's a preview for pastors. Wow. I was a pro-life pastor, and uh, you know, but really, all that meant was you know support the local pregnancy care center, and once a year you preach on life. But right. beyond that, what can we really do? Wow! And uh, my life was interrupted when I stood in front of that same abortion clinic, and uh, just wept as I stood there not only broken by the reality of abortion that my neighbors in my city were being impacted by this, but also hearing the stories of the miracles that God was doing because the church was showing up wow. and he was answering prayers. And, and they, not only were babies being saved, but just miraculous stories of people coming to Christ and uh, life transformation. And so what started in Charlotte expanded um, in, uh, to Greensboro and Raleigh in 2018. Wow. Uh, and then to New York City in 2019, uh, the, the devil really overplayed his hand with the Reproductive Health Care Act, and it really right. uh, awakened the church in New York City. Wow. And uh, so we've seen over 70 babies saved in New York City since 2019 in front of the largest Planned Parenthood uh, wow. in, in New York City, the Margaret Sanger Center. And, uh, and actually today, there, were, there was a set of twins that was saved in New York City. Uh, this morning, uh, they were scheduled to be aborted. And because there was a Christian witness there in front of that abortion clinic, those two uh, twin babies are going to live. Wow. And, uh, so, that was today. Uh, yeah, so that's really what the Lord has been doing. So, Seth, if I could just wow. share real briefly, this past year during the pandemic, you know, it, it became a time for the church to stand. And, and men like your pastor, Pastor Rob, who, who have courageously led you through this pandemic. We have a similar leader with, in our organization. Justin uh, has led us courageously. And so early on in the pandemic last year, we were all told to turn our lives upside down to protect the vulnerable from this disease, right. while at the same time being told that abortion was essential. And what we saw happening was 15, 20, 30, sometimes up to 50 women being crammed into these abortion clinics during a pandemic, not socially distancing, flying in abortionists from out of state to perform abortions on these mothers, while, while we were also being told that we had to go home, that we couldn't be there to pray, even right. though we were socially distant, right. even though we were abiding by the orders, yep. and we were offering life-saving resources. And they actually started arresting us. They started arresting uh, some yep. of our pastors. They told one of our pastors that they could not pray on a public sidewalk, that they had to go pray in their parking lot. And, and the Lord used that to awaken the church. And what we had been praying for, Lord, how do we spread this across the nation? The Lord used COVID as a catalyst uh, to help us go from, it took us four years to launch four cities to where we launched four new cities uh, in November of last year. We've already launched Tuscaloosa, Alabama and Detroit, Michigan this year. 
Uh, by God's grace, we're getting ready to launch, I believe, six more cities in the next five weeks. Wow. Uh, and that includes uh, Southern California. And uh, so we're uh, excited about what God is doing in California. And uh, so uh, I'll just stop there if you have some follow-up questions, Seth, and, and uh, we can kind of pump the brakes for a sec. Yeah, yeah. Wonderful. Praise God. Thank you so much for sharing, Josh. Yeah, and, and I don't know if you guys remember seeing this happen, but uh, the Benham brothers, one of the Benham brothers was arrested while social distancing praying outside on a public sidewalk while the abortion clinic in Charlotte was packing in women like cattle with no social distancing as they killed their babies. Because, as you know, praying is not essential, but lap dances, weed, and abortions were, were very essential. And so they, they contend together in that same city, um, very similar ministries. And so thank you so much for sharing, Josh. Um, um, why don't you share with us uh, just a little bit about the approach of love life, the strategy. So you're launching cities, um, you're uh, waking up the church, you're building up leaders, but talk to us a little bit about the game plan. What are the pillars of love life in the pillars that end up building the foundation of these um, ministries that are just representations of the bride of Christ loving their neighbor? Yeah, absolutely. So the first thing we're trying to do is identify uh, potential full-time missionaries that would be willing to come uh, to our training in Charlotte. We do a four-day boot camp uh, every other month here in Charlotte. We just trained 20 missionaries two weeks ago uh, from, the, uh, from around the nation. Uh, there were actually five folks from Southern California that were out here, uh, and uh, they Cheater are Hills, amazing. I'm, I'm bummed that I'm not uh, out there with them. Right now, I was supposed to be having several meetings, but uh, the Lord had other plans. And, uh, and so we're looking for a full-time missionary uh, that would be willing to come and be trained on all of the elements of love life. And uh, so that's the first uh, aspect uh, to really get love life launched in your city is to identify those key leaders. And then from there, the work doesn't get passed off onto the leaders. They are the ones who really then get to be a catalyst for working with the church of Jesus Christ in that city right. and to awaken the body of Christ. And so the primary tool for that, Seth, is the, the Saturday prayer walk and uh, the pillars that you mentioned, uh, just to give you guys an, an understanding, uh, we don't want the prayer walk to be the end of someone's journey. We want the prayer walk to be the beginning of their journey. And Amen. so by taking people to their local abortion clinic, they get to see the, the people in the ditch. Uh, Seth uses the, the uh, parable of the, um, the uh, help me, Seth. Good Samaritan. <laughs> COVID brain. Good, good Samaritan. Samaritan. <laughs> aye, aye, aye. The parable of the good Samaritan. Uh, and it's a wonderful illustration of these, these families who are in the ditch. And uh, we want to bring people to the ditch and show them this is the only place in our city where we know when and where broken and hurting people are showing up and where human beings are scheduled to die, it's very reasonable that we would be here. Right. And it activates the hearts and minds of believers who see the evil of abortion, the spiritual warfare and the tension. You guys would not believe the shenanigans that take place here in Charlotte from folks who are pro-abortion, um, but it's because they're afraid because the church is standing strong here and we're not angry. We're, we're not driven by a hatred for abortion. We don't love abortion, but we're driven by a beauty the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of Jesus is extravagant love for us. It's very reasonable for us. We view this as Christianity 101, hmm. that we would be present at these places of darkness. And so the prayer walk is just the beginning. And at the end of that prayer walk is where we say, listen, if you want to go beyond the prayer walk, here's four different ministry areas that we will help you get involved in. And that is sidewalk outreach. So we train people to effectively reach moms. We've seen over 2,600 families choose life uh, wow. since this ministry started uh, back in 2016. Wow. Um, so we train people. We have two, we have some of the best sidewalk outreach uh, folks in the nation. And uh, they have been doing this for over 15 years and uh, wow. just have a wealth of experience. And then also, um, Mentoring. So when families choose life at their local abortion clinic, uh, we have mentors who are trained and equipped to really just do life with these families and uh, help them with whatever obstacles that they face and specifically throw them a baby shower, make sure the needs of the baby are met for the first two years of the child's life. 
Wow. Uh, that's a very, very important uh, tool for really shifting the culture in the city. Cause of course, you know, the thing that, that gets leveled against us is we only care about babies in the womb, which is silly. Uh, so we want to go above and beyond by saying, no, we really do care about uh, the baby in the womb and after the baby is born and the mom, the dad, the family members, all of them, because Jesus cares about them. Right. Amen. And, uh, and so that's, that's our heart. Uh, restored life is another one that's our post abortive healing. And so we've seen an incredible movement of healing and restoration take place within the church. Uh, I understand from what Seth has shared with me that you guys have a wonderful, um, restored life ministry there, post abortive ministry there. You'll get to hear more about later. And so I just want to give honor to those of you who are already doing many of these ministries and uh, have been laboring so faithfully. I told Seth today, we're not there to start a fire. We're just, we're coming to pour gasoline on the fire that already exists. And so it's really an honor to yeah. uh, partner with you guys. Uh, and then the last one is um, orphan care. And uh, again, that's another ministry that I, I believe a, a couple there in the church has yeah. already uh, started. Yeah, uh, orphan but, and uh, what foster we try care, and yeah. Is, yeah, we, we try and educate the church on the need uh, for foster care, for Christians to really do the hard work of foster care. It's messy. It's difficult. It's a broken system, but there's a massive need over 400,000 kids in foster care in the United States. And, uh, so, uh, we're educating the church on that as well as equipping churches to kind of create a village around families who are fostering and adopting so that they feel Amen. loved and supported Amen. Uh, in their journey. And, uh, and so that's, that's the main pillars uh, of our ministry along with the prayer walk. Awesome. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? <laughs> well, uh, Josh, uh, thank you so much for sharing with us. Um, before we bid you farewell, and then I kind of localize this a little bit for us and talk about the individuals and couples who've been contending in these ways already. Um, one of the things, by the way, that Josh mentioned to me before is that when they work with churches, rarely is there um, familial and individual representation of all of these different ministry arms already present in the local church. <laughs> and it's already here. So I'm not this like, oh, cool, young, hip speaker who's coming to do pro-life stuff. I'm just coming in with what's already here because you guys have been so faithful in these ways and your pastor has been so faithful to support Amen. you. And we're just rallying everyone. We're just connecting. We're making sure everyone knows who everyone else is and how these ministries function together. And we're going to start thinking at a 60,000 foot view on how we can take back the state and take back life for the unborn. So really that's Josh's heart. That's the heart of love life. They, I love them because they care so little about their marketing and name and image. They just want to work with you to activate, engage, and to raise up the church. So Josh, before we say bye to you, why don't you just share with us, um, a, a powerful story that, that nearly brought me to tears the first time you shared it with me. Um, just as a little insight into what happens when just Christians show up and love their neighbor and are obedient. Yeah, I would love to. Actually, if we could have Micah show that nine-second clip real quick. Um, so I mentioned today that the five-year anniversary, our very first prayer walk took place today. And I just want you to see, uh, I want you to be encouraged because th this is how it started. You, you saw the big video of thousands of people showing up, but that's literally our very first prayer walk. Just a group of people standing on a patch of grass <laughs> with a tent. That's where we started. Wow. And the Lord has been so faithful. So let me share with you some, some stories just to in, invigorate your faith, because this is going to happen in Thousand Oaks. And I hope that you believe with me, um, because when, when God's people show up, miracles happen. God shows up in powerful, powerful ways. Um, and when we talk about culture shift, let me, let me tell you what that looks like. The very first year we were in New York City on our final week of prayer, it's our 40th week Celebrate Life prayer walk. We invite all of our churches to come back. That day there were about 400 New Yorkers standing across the street from the Margaret Sanger Center. Wow. And a little 16-year-old girl showed up. And instead of walking into the abortion clinic, she walked across the street into the crowd of Christians who were standing there worshiping and praying in front of the darkest place in Manhattan. And they, uh, they began to minister to her. One of the pastor's wives began to share with her and encourage her. And she literally walked back with the church to the location where our prayer walk started at, at another local church there. And she told them that a Planned Parenthood worker 
actually told her to show up on Saturday because the church would be there and she knew the church would help her. That's culture shift. Yeah. Um, one of the managers in Charlotte, she was the manager of the abortion clinic for 10 years. Uh, she helped launch other clinics for, for this family that owns, owns the, uh, organization. And, uh, she, uh, her niece came to have an abortion, uh, the very first year that we started in Charlotte and she changed her mind and uh, she chose life. And we connected her with a mentor in a local church and they threw her a huge baby shower and they just poured the love of Jesus on her. Well, guess who showed up to that baby shower? her aunt, who was the manager of the abortion clinic, we didn't know it at the time. And she watched how, how the God's people ministered to her niece. And she actually started sending moms out of the abortion clinic, telling them that they didn't have to go through with their abortion, that the people outside weren't crazy and they would actually help her because wow. they were doing it with her niece. And uh, so on our 40th week of prayer uh, that year, she walked out of that clinic she embraced one of our sidewalk counselors. She quit the industry. She's never gone back. She actually caters for some of our events. She has a catering company now. And uh, wow. so it's just one of many stories. And guys, if I can encourage you, there are many of the, the women who have chosen life that we've interacted with have a very common story. They were looking for a way out. They were looking for a sign. And the church was their sign. We believe that there's about 500 abortion clinics in the United States that do not have a Christian witness present on a consistent basis. And we want to change that so that no mom or dad who are looking for a way out and are looking for a sign would ever be able to say there was no one there to point me in another direction. There were no Christians there. And uh, so that's what we're inviting you to. We're inviting you into a movement of the church of Jesus Christ to stand at the gates of hell believing that he's given us everything we need to win this battle and to bring glory to Jesus. Amen. Amen. Awesome, Josh. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, he is on Eastern time, so uh, it's almost 11. So uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you for your time. Um, we're going to be in touch, and uh, we're, we're so grateful that you took the time to, to talk with us. Thank you for, you for what you're doing, and uh, we would love to be the second uh, ch major church partner in California to bring this here, um, especially in such a dark time and in such a dark state. So thank you so much. Yeah. God bless you guys. Love you. <laughs> Hey guys, we're going to get just right back to this special episode uh, discussing what we're doing here in Thousand Oaks, California in just one second, but I wanted to encourage you to consider becoming a patron of the show. Your support is what helps us create more episodes. We're going to be moving to two episodes a week soon, increase the production value of this show, um, and begin creating conversational content on the streets uh, to reach people with the pro-life message. So consider becoming a patron of the show by going to patreon.com forward slash unaborted and checking out our cool tiers that we have there. Uh, each one is at a higher financial commitment, but it helps us uh, be able to afford continue producing this show, bringing on new guests and getting the pro-life message out there uh, in the digital marketplace, which is the new marketplace of ideas in public square, where people are getting educated on how to think about the country and their own lives and what civic engagement look like looks like. So if you want to help us reach more people at this propitious moment in our country, go to patreon.com forward slash unaborted. Check out our fun tiers that you'll get perks for as well. And we really appreciate your support. We'll be right back with a whole lot more. Well, that's the uh, vice president of Love Life. You'll meet Justin Reeder at another time, I'm sure, as we continue to build this. He's the president and, and a phenomenal man as well. We had the blessing of spending some time together just in January um, after I preached at Chino Hills in October. All these people were like, 
we need to sign up for the pro-life ministry, Calvary Chapel Chino Hills. And then a new couple took over that ministry. They have now become full-time love life missionaries. And five members of Calvary Chapel Chino Hills just spent four days out in Charlotte going through the whole training um, with the goal of creating all of those full-time love life missionaries. So Jack Hibbs ended up green lighting uh, love life. Um, and that becomes the first major church partner of love life on the West Coast um, in California. So it's uh, incredible. And again, this is not to say anything against churches that already have a pro-life ministry, okay? It's just in my experience doing this for a decade now, I haven't seen someone think at this level, activate at this level, strategize at this level, and then pour in time and talent and funds in order to make this happen, to trade money for lives and to sacrifice our time, our energy, and our money to do so. So with the time remaining you, here, you guys, and I, and I want to I get you out here of a reasonable time, I just kind of want to briefly go through some of the pillars he talked about. I want to localize this a little bit for us. I want to introduce you to some people at this church. Um, some of you will know them. Some of you won't know them. Again, because God speaks been growing so quickly, many of us don't know each other for that, for that one beautiful reason. It just takes time to get to know more people. So I want you to understand some of the people who have already been contending in these spheres for life at this church for a long time, because this is us. This is a team. This is a partnership. This is not Rob McCoy. This is not Seth Gruber. This is not love life, really. Um, this is the bride of Christ. This is God speak Calvary Chapel simply doing what we're called to do, which is to love our neighbors at the only place that we know innocent human beings are scheduled to die. So the first one that Josh talked about was sidewalk counseling, okay? And this is the most simple implementation of the church's obedience to love our neighbor. We know where these innocent human beings are scheduled to die. We know where broken families are showing up in search of a solution that will only compound their problems and lead to increased suffering over the course of their life. And we can simply show up. And when we show up, everything changes. When God's people show up, he shows up as well and miracles truly happen. And we know this because 40 Days for Life has found that during their 40 day f Days for Life campaigns, when many abortion workers leave the industry, they've had multiple abortion workers tell them, uh, during your 40 Days for Life uh, prayer campaigns, you, you know, you Christians, um, we would see like a 75% no-show for abortion appointments when you were out there praying every day. And now they've left the industry and they're thanking the Christians for doing that. So what does that tell you, brothers and sisters? It tells you that eternity is written on the heart of man. It tells you that God's reign falls on the just and the unjust. It tells you that when a man or woman is at such a low point in their life that they've rationalized in their mind, spending their money to pay a hitman, and they're walking into that center where that hitman works, they still have a still small voice because they have a sense of shame associated with being seen by others. Why else would they cancel their abortion appointments when all those pesky Christians were out there praying? Not yelling and screaming, not saying you baby murderer, no. Just praying and saying, ma'am, we're here for you, we love you, those people in there do not love you, what can we do to support you? Up to 75% no-shows for abortion appointments. So what does it look like to put a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the country every day they perform abortions? Well, it looks like, in my opinion, bankrupting the abortion industry in a matter of years. That's what we want to do here. So we're going to show you one other quick video clip, and then I want to introduce you to um, a mother and daughter at this church. Many of you know already, some of you don't, and we're going to localize this here for our community and our church. But I want to show you this, this story of how all these pillars kind of work together and what happens when, when we show up. So this is a story of the Wiggins family, uh, I believe, from Charlotte, North Carolina. We came to just, the abortion clinic, we feel like, you know, we didn't want to- It was just no help, like, we was helpless, yeah. like- We didn't want to bring a baby into our situation. We just uh, thought it was the only way, you know, we was just like, this is selfish to the baby. We felt like, you know, we didn't have no hope in nothing, you know, cause we've been living in hotels for maybe almost two years now. So, you know, we lost everything, stuff in the storage, everything, we lost everything. So we just starting from the scratch. When the Wiggins arrived, and I, I just kind of glanced to my side, and I see a beat-up old car, windows down, and the the woman said, we have no choice. We have to abort this baby. What are we going to do? My car pulled up. I meet these people, <laughs> and they're talking to me, and they're saying, no, no, you don't want to do that. And just the conversation got deeper and deeper, and then I just decided, like, okay, well, Maybe this was meant for me to meet these people. Maybe, you know, 
it's a purpose in this. So within that same day, really, I changed my mind about the abortion with the baby. And we kind of went from there. So uh, so we call up life and tell them this: these people need everything and they need it all tomorrow. And Love Life instantly took on, you know, helping us to find a car, uh, helping us with the housing issue, getting them set up with a mentor in a church right away. It made, it made us think about things better than abortion. You know, we had to think about, you know, that's a baby life. You know, God blessed us with this baby for a reason. So, you know, with the, when the idea of us getting married, you know, we, we've been together for 12 years. I mean, it came across our mind, like, yeah, we're going to get married. One just, day, we just never... And just <laughs> never got around to it. Just from, from that day, we went to the abortion clinic, and everything came to us at one time. Yeah. Well, I was, like, keeping the, the baby, marriage, you know, mm -hmm. um, help with people and stuff. So it made us look at things different. I've never had no one to reach out and help us, for somebody to reach out and say, I love this family, like... Mm -hmm and just play that role. Like they took it on right away. They took the role on right away. Like that same day I met them, they took that role on to help me and, and, and get my mind from thinking a negative way about the pregnancy to thinking the positive is gonna work out. Uh, it's just a process that you have to go through and are you willing to do that? And I said, yeah, I would do that. Would y'all encouraging me out? Pretty cool, huh? Well, we can go home now. <laughs> so that is just one of dozens and hundreds and hundreds of stories. I mean, you heard Josh mention 2,700 families saved. And I, I like that family saved, right? You got the child's immediate life saved, but you're saving the eternal souls and the heartache of, of broken families who arranged the death of their own, one of their own. By the way, about 2,700 to 3,000 babies are killed every day in America. And all that work for 2,700 lives and 2,700 families, what would it look like if just a handful of churches did that all across the country? So that's what we want to do, and that's what we want to build here. But you know what? I'm not necessarily building anything new. There's many people who have been contending in sidewalk counseling and prayer and ad adoption and foster care and being mentor families to other individuals. So I want to, I want to welcome up uh, Tammy and Chelsea. Um, some of you guys uh, know them. We had the, the blessing of spending some time with them uh, recently uh, for dinner at their house. Um, so why don't you go ahead and give them a round of applause. <laughs> Where's the mic? <laughs> Wonderful, perfect. Hi, Dammy. Hi, Chelsea. How are you guys? Great. Good. Thank you guys so much for coming out. Um, so I just wanted everyone to meet you guys. This is Tammy. This is her daughter, Chelsea. Um, and how long have you been at Godspeak? Probably six years. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So for some time. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Um, how many of you don't know them? Okay, see, so that's why I wanted to do this. I figured a lot of you guys uh, didn't know each other. So, um, th so Tammy has been, has been outside of abortion clinics for a while. She's been doing prayer and worship sessions. She gets like 20 plus people out there. She's been driving to the Ventura Clinic, which performs later term abortions. And she actually, she really does engage with women. I mean, again, God bless you if you just go outside there and pray. But we want to do more than that here. We don't just want to stand there and pray. We want to try to lovingly engage these families by saying, you don't have to do this. We're here for you. And she's been doing that for some, for some time. So, just share, firstly, kind of how God got a hold of your heart, your involvement in the pro-life issue kind of writ large, yeah. and, and kind of the avenue and the lane that God took you on. Yeah. So uh, years ago, I served on the board of directors at the Conejo Valley Women's Resource Center, which turned to the, um, uh, well, actually, it was Crisis Pregnancy Center turned to Women's Resource Center. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. And... Um, and I thought that I was doing so much good, raising money for them, keeping our center thriving, um, raising our kids. So we have four children that are grown now, but um, raising them up in a godly family. I thought I was doing so much good. And, and then we started coming to God speak, and I would hear Pastor McCoy every week say, what are you doing to engage culture? What are you doing? And I brought that to the Lord. What am I doing to engage culture? Um, and then I went and saw the movie Unplanned when it came out opening night and it wrecked me. I, I've always been pro-life and stood for that, but when I saw that 
ultrasound guided um, abortion where the baby didn't stand a chance and it fought for its life. And it just got sucked down the vacuum and broken, and broken into pieces. I was completely wrecked. So the next day I was like, okay, God, what am I gonna do for culture? And I went down to the 99 cent store and I made up poster boards and, poster boards and wrote on there, um, you are loved um, to the expectant mother. And went down and met the 40 Days for Life people on the corner and just decided to wow. bring love to our community. Um, and I started asking some of my Christian friends, you know, why aren't we doing this? Why, I've mostly met Catholic friends out there. Why aren't we doing this? <laughs> wow. And their answer was, um, well, we're just kind of turned off by the signs of blood and baby parts. And, and I said, it doesn't have to be like that. Like, ooh, this can be about all love, never any judgment, no shame. You know, let's get our own signs of all about love and loving the expectant mother. And um, that's where it started. Wonderful, awesome. And so now you've actually been, you've been activating people and getting them involved in showing up and praying and worshiping, and, you've, and you're also doing regular sidewalk counseling too. So talk to us a little bit about what you're doing now. Yeah, so um, Pastor McCoy, I just thought to myself, God, how can we start a fire here in Thousand Oaks? How can we wake up our church, our churches? And I asked Pastor McCoy, would you have a movie night and show unplanned to our church? And he said yes, within a heartbeat. And With and a so, lot of other pastors that said yes, right? Yeah, but then, yes, but yeah, well, sort of. <laughs> I mean, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, speak poorly, but... Yeah, it's so pastor. He was the only pastor that said yes, yeah. <laughs> At the time. I mean, I was really hopeful it was going to grow. Um, but we had about 170 of you come out for that movie night and then sign up. And so I was able to si start an email base, which I called Stand in Love. Um, and then from that, God just put on my heart, you know, how we enter with God is that we, we enter with worship. Out of the story of King Jehoshaphat in the Old Testament, it's Second Chronicles chapter 20, that we put our singers and worshipers on the front line. Mm. And that's how we break down these spiritual, the, this veil, right? Like this darkness, like we're all like way too silent. So how are we going to break this down? And so I started doing uh, worship and prayer and praise nights every Thursday night, uh, candlelight vigil in front of Planned Parenthood. It's really incredible to take Jesus to the streets. Um, and, you know, worship and praise, the music's blasting, and we are worshiping in front of our Planned Parenthood here on Hillcrest Drive every Thursday night. Um, so we have, awesome. I have about 150 people from God Speak and other churches that have joined. Um, so They're when cool. he said, you know, we're here to pour gasoline on the fire, I'm like, Lord, that is such an answer to my prayer because Amen. I wanted to start a fire and now the gasoline's so awesome. coming. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Great line. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. And then, uh, uh, Chelsea, you, you tag along with mom sometimes as well, right? And I know yeah. your heart's for life as well. Would you yeah. like to share anything about um, your heart for life or how you're involved as well? Yeah, yeah. I just want to share that I'm, I'm here because she's here, because she said yes. And hmm. she modeled for us our entire lives that, that we're pro-life as a family and we're going to fight for these babies. And so from the time that I was like probably five years old, we were doing walks for life in the community. And I didn't necessarily know at the time what abortion was, but I knew that we were standing for moms and we were standing for babies. And yeah. Um, and that just spoke volumes. And here I am turning 30 this year, like you said, yep. and um, I'm a nurse now. And so I get the opportunity to volunteer at Ohana Clinic and possibly save the Storks van in Ventura. They just got a, a mobile unit that will do ultrasounds in front of the Planned Parenthood in Ventura. So I'm hoping to be able to help them out too. So it's just amazing what God does when one person's obedience says yes. And now we have our whole family on board. Um, it's, it's just so cool. So I encourage all of you parents and grandparents get involved. You know, your kids Amen. will see what you're doing, you'll, they'll see that step of obedience and their hearts will be changed. So even if they're not pro-life right now, you getting involved, you taking that step of faith will change their hearts too. Like it has our entire family. Praise God. Awesome. Thank yeah. you guys. Thanks so much. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you guys for staying tuned into this special episode. I hope this conversation at Godspeed Calvary Chapel is blessing you, encouraging you, and equipping you to stand and do something similar in your local community where the church takes personal responsibility to end abortion in this country. But hey, you know we show a lot of visuals on this show, plus I know you want to see me, right? And so if you'd like to engage with this show and watch it visually, consider subscribing at my YouTube channel, which is Seth Gruber, a voice for the unborn. And check out our show, watch this visually as a vodcast on abortion with Seth Gruber on YouTube. Uh, subscribe to our channel, uh, hit the notifications bell so that you don't miss an episode, uh, and you'll be able to enjoy the show in a different way. We also know that YouTube is one of the biggest digital marketplaces, and we want to get the right kind of ideas out there uh, to balance the madness and the uh, sort of debunked and debased moral views that are pushed on these social media platforms. So consider going over to YouTube, subscribing, hit the notification bell, help us reach more people. We really appreciate it, and we'll be right back with a whole lot more. So if, if one or two people's obedience can yield that kind of fruit, uh, what would all of your obedience yield in this city, in this county, and in this state? I mean, I haven't even counted the numbers. We'll, uh, maybe we'll, we'll have uh, Micah and Isaac count so we have a number. But look, look at this. This is incredible. And this is, this is probably double, triple what you would get at a church four times the size of God speak. If you said a pro-life informational night on a Friday night, it's like, yeah, right, dude. <laughs> So praise God for that. So listen, Love Life has training for all of these pillars, okay? So they're just going to kind of be our stepfather, our big brother. They're here for us. They have the infrastructure. They have the support. They're here to pour into us, to train us, to remove the fear of doing something you haven't done before. And that's what I'm here for. And that's what, what we, we want to build a team of leaders here who will be doing as well. So you have people to get involved with and you have opportunities of where to go get involved with. So that's the first pillar, sidewalk counseling. But I just want you to to know the people in the church who are already contending in this area. And it looks like we have 130 people here tonight. So praise God. Thank you so much. Okay. So secondly, prayer walks, right? Um, Josh talked about how when they would launch in a new city, what their goal is, is to have a church adopt a week. And the pastor would preach on life on Sunday. The church would fast and pray on Wednesday. And on Saturday, we'd all come out from this church as well as local churches, if you can rally them. And we do a big prayer walk and we'd finish with worship. We'd worship outside of the abortion clinic. And then we'd have time for kids and families to all be together. Um, and so a lot of what Tammy and Chelsea do is actually already in that same vein, right? She's doing prayer and she's doing sidewalk counseling. So these pillars kind of work together as well, but we want you to just be aware of them and where you can get involved uh, with them because we believe that when you take people to the places of death, everything changes. And most of the staff on staff at Love Life were former pastors who like Josh said that they were pro-life. Right? Uh, we give a one-time donation to the local pregnancy resource center, and I give the pregnancy resource center director five minutes to share about the pregnancy resource center on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. We're a super pro-life church. Well, that's most of the people now on staff at Love Life, but you know what changed everything? Justin Reeder, the founder of Love Life, said, come with me outside of the abortion centers and watch me pray over and try to engage women, sometimes who have a visible bump as they walk into the center to kill their child. Josh's heart breaks, he leaves his church and joins. My buddy Brian, pastor in Charlotte, goes out there, heart breaks, blood boils, leaves, joins the ministry. Most pastors, even pro-life ones, have never stood outside of an abortion center. Did you know that? So these are shepherds that are allowing the abortion of the lambs. And when pastors and Christians show up, everything truly does change. So as we begin engaging Thousand Oaks and Ventura County, there are already tools available to you to begin doing this. If you go download the Love Life app, okay, it's called Love Life USA, and I'm going to give you that again at the end of the night. But right now, download Love Life USA. They actually have a guided prayer walk. So you can just pop in your AirPods. You can stand out there and go through the prayer walk that they'll guide you through. They also do this really cool thing called Love Life Live. Now, it's on Eastern time and it's on Saturday morning. So for you and us, that's going to mean 6 a.m., okay, because they go live at 9 a.m. Eastern. But you can, it stays up on their social media, so you can still watch it later, okay? And so they do this really cool thing where they have Justin or Josh or their other guy, Brian, at the Love Life studio. And then they're live streaming in 
Love Life missionaries and foot soldiers all around the country who are at that moment outside their local abortion clinic sharing stories of what God's doing. And sometimes you get a live story in real time where they're saying a mom just ran back out out to us with the literature. And one of our one of our sidewalk counselors is talking to her right now or praying over her. So you get these live stories of Christians all around the country. You can pray over them. They start with worship together. So you can actually tune into this live. It's really cool. And then they'll be happy to uh, to integrate us into that live Stream as we begin contending on Saturday mornings outside abortion clinics. So just some things to make you aware of and really cool things that they're doing. So if you want to connect with um, any of these pillars, and at the end, we're going we're gonna to give you a way to do that as well. You can fill out a connect card at the back. You can also go into the Love Life USA app, and you can go to the connect tab and fill out a connection box. And you would check the boxes of the ministry areas you're interested in. That just connects you into Love Life with the hope that we'll have a Love Life missionary here who's actually full time and rallying all of us. In the meantime, I, Tammy, and others will be working together as a leadership team and, and trying to secure people to do this full time because most, you know, most of us are, have other jobs, of course. So you, ha- you have sidewalk counseling, you have prayer walks, and then you have restored life. Okay, this is post-abortion healing. Okay, um, far too many men and women are sitting in the pews of our churches, broken and hurting from a former abortion and never having healed from it, never having dealt with it. My colleague Mike Spencer once said that pastor silence on abortion doesn't spare men and women in his church hurt, it spares them healing. And you know how many pastors I've told me have told me the reason one of the reasons they won't sp- speak against abortion in their church is cuz oh, I don't want to offend people in my church who are post abortive. Well, you're sparing them healing, pastor, because you have the truth and the grace and the love of Christ. And so rather than saying that Jesus is just as eager to forgive your sin as any other sin, abortion is any other sin, you say, I can't address that for the sake of their pain. Well, abortion is just a soapbox opportunity for pastors to get onto and address the broken hearts of the men and women in their church, because we believe that God wants to turn those ashes into beauty and use people to help where they used to hurt. Well, this is just another pillar of what love life and what we're implementing here, because we want those people healed, pouring into the lives of other men and women, because there is curriculum and healing for men and women, so that they can begin mentoring in for others who are post-abortive and also getting involved in sidewalk counseling and prayer, because who better to say, don't do this than someone who made that mistake and God putting those healed hearts outside of the clinics where they once walked into. So I want to invite up Vicki for you right now. Vicki attends this church, and she is actually on staff with Healing Hearts, a ministry that does post-abortion healing for men and women. So why don't you welcome Vicki? Hi, Vicki. How are fine. you? I'm fine. How Good. Are thank you? you so much for coming. Good, so my, our family had the blessing of getting to know Vicki as well recently when we were at dinner with, with Tammy and her family. And we're just so grateful for you. Um, again, everything is already represented at Godspeak, guys. So I'm not doing anything new. You, your brothers and sisters are already contending in all of these pillars. And Vicki's been doing that for a while. So Vicki, tell us your story. Tell us uh, sort of a, a brief story of where you were at the lowest point in your life, how God healed you, and how he's used that in your life. Okay. Well, um, my story began in 1975. I was 19 years old. I was still a virgin. I was going to be a virgin until I got married. And I went to a party and got drunk and passed out and was taken advantage of. I was basically date raped. And I became pregnant from that first time. And through People telling me, oh, Vicki, you know, you don't want to keep this baby. You know, it's not fair to your parents. It's not fair to hear and all that. So I went ahead and I had an abortion. And when I left from the abortion, I thought, I'm going to put this behind me. I am Hmm. not going to think about this ever again. Hmm. Well, let me tell you, you think about it all the time. And any woman who has had an abortion, I know that they think about it all the time. And, but what happened was when I got married to my husband and we were trying to have children, found out I couldn't. Mm. I, I was not producing progesterone. I had scarring in my fallopian tubes and I took the doctor's side. Now, please note, I had not told my husband that I had had an abortion. I thought it was something that he didn't need to know. Mm -hmm. And so I took the doctor's side and I asked him, was it because I had an abortion? And he said, yes. Hmm. 
Hmm. So at that point, I still didn't tell my husband. And then I was at Calvary Chapel Oxnard, and this lady got up and she started talking about a healing heart study and about it for post-abortive women. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've got to go to this. Wow. And, and, and so I told my husband, I said, Gary, I said, I'm going to go to this. And he said, you're going to teach it? Why are you going to teach it? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm going to go to it. And then that's when I confessed to him that I had an abortion. And bless his heart, he said, I support you, babe. Mm. I support you 100%. You go to this. So, um, so I went to the study, and I got the healing. I, I finally didn't have the shame and the guilt anymore, and that I knew that I was forgiven, and that when Christ took my sins on, he took them all. And so, wow. I, um, so I, just, I thought, hmm, God, do you want me to be part of this ministry? Well, he was really quiet. When I took it, it was in 1999. It wasn't until 2015 that God called me to the ministry. Wow. Yeah. Awesome. And I was, Wonderful. at that time, I was on the board of, director, board of directors for the Ventura County Pregnancy Center. Right. And they had me um, get up and give my testimony about the Healing Heart Study. And I, um, at that point then, boom, God put it on my heart to become part of it. And I, and I talked to, I'm sorry, and I talked to Pastor Rob about bringing the ministry into the church, and he said, absolutely. Praise God. Absolutely. Awesome. So um, we have one. Uh, should, should I go on? Should yeah, I go share on? Share a little bit about the ministry now. Okay. The, the, the ministry is, it's a, it's a gospel-centered, uh, grace-driven, it's a gospel-centered, gospel grace-driven ministry, and it was started in 1988 by uh, a lady by the name of Sue Liljenberg. I always right. say it wrong. Liljenberg. And because of her, it is now international. Wonderful. And we have it here. We have one that's called Binding Up the Brokenhearted. It's for post-abortive women. And, and uh, that one is, in fact, we're, we're going to start two studies. We also have one called The Hem of His Garment. That one doesn't cover abortion, but it covers everything else, such as divorce, abuse, yeah. unforgiveness, bitterness, anger. It covers everything. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you yeah. so much for sharing, Vicki. Thank, Thank you. you for being here. <laughs> so Vicki is on staff with Healing Hearts. I mean, this is her job. This is what she does. And uh, she has a good friend who couldn't make it here tonight, but she's sort of the regional coordinator of the area as well. And this is actually the curriculum Love Life uses in Charlotte. Uh, and they love this curriculum, and they believe it's, it uh, focuses more on who you are in Christ than what you've done. Um, but you have to deal with what we've done. That's what sin is. We have to repent and turn from it. And uh, we're so grateful for Vicki being here. Listen, if you've had an abortion, if you've been, played a role in an abortion, man or woman, and you still haven't healed from this, know that Vicki's here. Know that this church cares for you, loves you, wants to support you through a journey of healing. And we want you involved now to fight and prevent others from making the same mistake. And we're grateful that you're here. Um, and of course, the hope is that these people then begin um, pouring back into the community and reaching out to local churches to get post-abortion Bible studies, post-abortion healing Bible studies started and engaging in sidewalk counseling as well. So all of these pillars really do begin um, working together. So we have sidewalk counseling, prayer walks, we have restored life, and then we have orphan and foster care. And we have more information for all of these things if you want to get involved. I just didn't want to get too in the weeds on all of them. Um, but just like with the sidewalk counseling, just like with the post-abortion healing, you have a family represented that tends God speak that helps individuals begin fostering and supports them as they're fostering. And so I want to uh, welcome up Heather and Daniel Fowler, um, who attend God speak as well. Thank you guys. Yeah, come on over here. Here you go. 
So my wife and I have been quite busy. Um, we've been having dinner with everyone. Um, so we just had dinner with them. Was that last night? It was last night. Last yep. night. Okay. Good to see you again. Yeah, nice seeing you. Uh, by the way, uh, just if you guys ever want to say hi, so you know my wife. My wife is walking right there. Her name's Olivia. Um, she's my better half, and that's our, our three-month-old Annie Brave. Um, and we have a, a three-year-old Cedar Justice as well. Um, so say hi to her because my job keeps her quite tired, um, and uh, she's very happy to be here as well. So this really is our heart to be here with you, and they just poured into us last night. We had a great time together. So share with us, um, I mean, you're in business, right? Mm -hmm. But you guys, your heart is knit together. You run this yeah. ministry together. So share with us um, your journey with, uh, with adoption, with foster care, and then your heart to support those who are doing the same. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, um, we, we joined the Godspeak family about a year ago. And um, so the really cool thing about all of this and hearing him speak and hearing everybody else who's been sharing is that really all of these ministries and organizations have been birthed from personal experience. So whether mm. it's you're doing it or God has called you to this ministry early on, there's some sort of personal experience or testimony that you can share about it. And the same is true with, with Child Hope Services, which is our foster care ministry and organization that we started about six years ago. Awesome. So we so have, cool. uh, we're a family of seven. Uh, we have five kids, three of them are biological and two are adopted through foster care. And uh, without kind of going, you know, the big long story I say with, you know, I have a tendency to go around the block just to get across the street with my words. So. Me too. And I have a mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't have a countryman, but uh, uh, anyway, so the Lord sort of called us to adoption. Like that was our first path. So, you know, Heather's in high school. She's dreaming about saving the world and saving children. I'm playing video games. And, Classic. you know, by the time we're married, we have three biological kids and we're going to round up to four with adoption. So we started down that international path and uh, the Lord just sort of pivoted us over to foster care when we ran into a family that had adopted through foster care. Hmm. And it was like, hey man, like there's so many kids that need hope and opportunity in life. Wow right here in our very own backyard, what would that look like? And yeah. so we attended some meetings, started asking a bunch of questions and said, you know, the Lord is calling us to foster care. We knew that path was going to be different um, if adoption was ultimately the, the goal. Uh, but we knew that God was going to insert us into the life of a child and we were going to be utilized mm. however God had intended us, you know, to be used in the life of that child. Wow. So, uh, we engaged in foster care and all throughout our own personal journey, there was a lot of impactful things, um, a lot of stuff that was provided, people that rallied and journeyed around us and said, hey, man, we don't necessarily want to be, you know, bringing kids in in our, in our season of life right now, but we want to come alongside you and join you in what you're doing. And here's the way in which we're going to do it. And so there was wow. a lot of things that were impactful to us. Um, that, uh, you know, ultimately we just became foster parents and we did that for a long time. And ultimately the Lord brought, uh, two little girls over the course of four and a half years to be a part of our forever family. They're half sisters and wow. they get to spend eternity together, uh, you know, with us and, and they love the Lord at the ages that they are. And anyway, so we can go on Praise forever, God. but, yeah. but through that, through the, the personal story journey part, mm. um, after we had finished with adoption of our second little uh, daughter, it was how can we still be involved? Right. And so all we did was just say, okay, the things that were really impactful to us on our personal journey and story, how can we expand that? How can we offer, you know, this opportunity and resources to, yeah, yeah, yeah. to other families and kind of help them overcome the prohibiting hurdles that, yeah, they, yeah. that they're running into. Yeah, so wonderful. We started Child Hope Services uh, six years ago. And uh, we basically do three things, if I can just yes, share. Please. So here's the three things that we do. Um, we have the Hope Fund. So the idea is hmm. that if you boldly raise your hand and say, I want to be involved in foster care, uh, we don't want there to be any prohibiting hurdles. So we're going to provide all the resources that you need in order to become a certified foster home. Wonderful. So beds, cribs, strollers, car seats, emergency, uh, earthquake, safety kits, second story ladders. Like, what do you need in order to become a certified home? Right. We and your an, garage is kind of functioning as a we storage used to have. We used to have a garage uh, that was just absolutely packed. We now have an office and a warehouse in Camarillo that's stocked with a ton of resources for families. So when you hit the launch button and you say, I want to do this, yeah. and you quickly add up all the dollars that you need in order to get your home certified, and then you say, you know what, I can't do it. 
nope, not going to happen. Right. We have all the resources you need right. uh, to become a certified awesome. home. So we do that. So no excuses. No excuses. Yeah. Uh, now you become certified. You bring a child into your home. Um, Upon, upon placement, whether it be your first or your hundredth, within 24, 48 hours, we're gonna supply what's called a hope chest. And so that is a one week supply of clothing, PJs, brand new toiletries, diapers and wipes, um, wow. to basically help you in that, that critical first moment of placement. And then lastly, hope community. So the thing that's really, really important is that this is a ministry in a life and a calling hmm. that can make you feel alone. Yeah. So the idea is how can we draw together like-minded families that are doing the same thing to create connection and relationships? It's time and intentionality that creates relationships. And so uh, let's awesome. put together some events and things that are gonna be able to help individuals hmm. uh, create sustainability in this. So we do right. something called the Foster Care Summit and that's you know, a wow. few hundred families come out and we do a half day uh, seminar to fill up your empty cup and to equip you and arm you for foster care and adoption. Wow. Uh, we do events at the park. So um, I loved that nine second clip of like 10 people gathering around a tent. The first event we did six and a half years ago was the same idea. Yeah. We just wheeled out the barbecue and said, hey, if you're in this life and in this world wow. and you want to come out and be a part, come do it. And it was just like wow. a gaggle of families uh, that came out and gathered. And then now it's, you know, thousands of families and kids we've been able to um, help and impact uh, in wow. Ventura County over the Praise last God. six and a half years. So wow. that's that's my quick Yeah, story. yeah. Thank you so much. <laughs> Did you want to share anything? Um, yes. I just want to say thank you to you for opening up my eyes to all that you're doing. And Tammy, I've been able to join her on some prayer walks twice. And that was awesome. I mean, life changing. So good. Super cool. What's Wonderful. Happening here. Yeah. I will say this before I hand it back over. Um, and I've heard it. Um, Tammy shared and I think your daughter. It was um, saying yes. Hmm. Like what we say is our job is to identify the need in the communities in which we live, pray about how God would use you in hmm. the season of life and with your skill set and your tools and talents that he has given you, and then respond and say yes. Like it's our job to identify the need, pray about how God would use us, right. and then do it, yeah. right? So we're saying yes and being obedient, and sometimes that's where we... That's where we miss out is the yes part and the obedience part. So right. it's so cool to hear everybody talking about, you know, I'm saying yes, I'm being obedient and I'm, and therefore I'm going to go do, and then watching God just bless you saying yes. Yeah. And so that's a common theme that I've seen throughout this entire thing. Amen. So. Awesome. Thank you guys. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you guys. You guys have probably heard the statistics. People say something like this. If one family at every church in the United States of America were to foster and were to adopt, all of the children would have a home and we would not need the foster care system. One family at every church in the country. But we love our comfort, don't we? Much more than our obedience. And so that's what we're trying to change here with such a fired up, impassioned group of people. I just want to add this in terms of orphan and foster care. There are about a million people on a waiting list to adopt children in America. But there are 400,000 children in the foster care system because that's harder. That's messier. That's more difficult. And the average age is about eight years old. So you're not getting a perfect, unaffected infant that every family wants. You're having to engage with children who have been wounded, who have been hurt, and more so than anyone else needs the gospel of Jesus Christ and needs the bride of Christ rallying around them to love them and support them. So that's why we're so grateful for the Fowlers and their ministry, Child Hope. Look at everything that's represented already at God Speak. And the last pillar is mentoring, and they talked about this. So mentor families support those who are fostering, but mentor families also support families who have chosen life. And so that was a huge part of the Wiggins story that we played you earlier, right? That changed their life. They were living out of hotels. They lost everything that they had in storage because they didn't have, they weren't able to pay the storage fee. So they lost it all. They're pregnant and Christian showed up <laughs> and gave them everything that they needed. And now they're walking with the Lord and have a beautiful baby. So mentor families are assigned. Think of it like an assigned neighbor, like you're promising to love your neighbor 
and you're saying, this is the neighbor that I'll love. And you love on them. You have them over for dinner. You get to know them and you disciple them with the hope that not only is this child now saved from a human dismemberment procedure, but it, their parents are now walking with the Lord, raising that child in the church. And many of the stories in Charlotte are those babies end up getting dedicated in the very church where Christians attend who are outside of the abortion clinic that day. So that's what mentor families do. And that involves hosting a baby shower, just showering love on this mother, giving her diapers for a year if she needs it, helping her get a car if she doesn't have transportation, getting her out of a dangerous relationship if she is in one, um, and providing everything that she needs. And again, there's training for all of this, okay? I just don't want to overwhelm you with all these things um, of, of how to do it. I'm just saying this is what we can do, and we're going to help you um, do that. And so all of these pillars work together, right? As you get healed from abortion, you start mentoring others. You start getting involved in sidewalk counseling. When you meet broken families outside of abortion, clinics because you're sidewalk counseling, you assign them to a mentor family who then throws a baby shower for them and loves on them. All of these pillars work together. And so I don't expect any of you to do all of them unless you're eager to do so, in which case, amen. But I'm just showing you the different pillars that you can help build that create the foundation of taking back the ground that the enemy has taken in this state. Because as you're well aware of the type of evil stuff and legislation that, and decay that happens in California rarely stays in California. So if you're eager to get involved in one of these pillars, again, download the Love Life USA. That's what it's called. You have to put USA, Love Life USA app, click the connect tab, fill out a connection card, and then check the boxes of the ministry areas that you're interested in. Now, this is a call for leaders. If you're saying, okay, I heard Seth preach in November, he made me feel horrible for not doing anything. Rob mentions abortion every other Sunday. Okay, fine. Maybe you're in retirement. Maybe you feel like God's calling you to do this full time. Maybe you feel like God's pricking your conscience to, to leave your career that you're doing right now and do this full time. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm saying if that's you and you're eager to do more than just be a volunteer in this ministry, which by the way is the majority of the ministry. So that's not to demean that if that's you. We, I, we need tons of foot soldiers and volunteers. But if you're saying... I think I want to do this full time. Then this call in this moment is for you. I speak in churches all around the country, as you're aware. I'm probably only going to be at God Speak about two Sundays a month a lot of the time. Um, and then I'm traveling during the week sometimes. Uh, Tammy and Vicki and the Fowlers, they have other jobs. Uh, I've got Vicki who's full time with Healing Hearts. We can't run this ourselves full time. So the hope, and here's the prayer, is that we get an individual a couple or two different people to become love life missionaries. If you do that, love life um, will help a matching grant for the first year to help you launch. But there is a track for you to run on. There is a plan and there is training. This is like a regional director job. And so you're joining our team and what we're building um, to raise up a unified front and body of Christ to put a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic. So this means activating local church partners. I know you're thinking, but everyone hates God speak. Well, give them a reason not to and, and, and welcome them into, into what we're already doing here. It also means raising up individual foot soldiers because what we start here isn't going to stay here. We want to be such a faithful witness on life that it creates scandals in other churches because of the silent shepherds who call, who's congregants won't allow them to be silent anymore because those congregants will look at God speak and go eternal souls are being saved from dismemberment. Families are meeting Jesus and committing their lives to raise the child in the church where the pastor was outside the abortion clinic that day. What are you doing pastor? Right. That's what we want to build here is through our faithfulness and through a light on a hill. It will make every other church shine brighter to create a blinding light for the gospel in one of the most darkest spiritual states in this country where what starts here doesn't stay here. And that's just as true for righteousness as it's obviously been for evil in this state for so long. So if you want to respond to the call to become a missionary, you'll go through a four day training in Charlotte, which already has seven people from Chino Hills who have gone through it. Um, then you'll begin a 90 day plan working alongside love life with goals, with help and with training. And on the 90th day, you're officially released and confirmed. And this is just to make sure that this is exactly who's supposed to be with their ministry to see if you can apply yourself and devote yourself for those three months. So the 
call to action for people who are interested in that is to go to lovelife.org forward slash America, www.lovelife.org forward slash America. Everyone else who just wants to be a volunteer and it's like, tell me what lane to go into, Seth, that's on the app. Okay, that's Love Life USA, the connect tab. Click the box of the ministry you're interested in. Lovelife.org forward slash America. And then if you don't have a smartphone, that's okay. When you leave, grab one of the God's Speak Connect cards, okay? Please write your name, your email address, and your phone number, and the pillar that you're interested in volunteering with. If you don't have a smartphone, you can't download an app. But that app is available on Android and iTunes. But again, if you're like, maybe I'm supposed to do this full time, and God's pricking my heart, lovelife.org forward slash America. We will be your support team. You already have volunteers here ready to go, but we do need that one or two people who will say, I want to do this full time as a regional coordinator for Love Life in Ventura County. Okay. Now, here's how this fits into the California vision, and we're going to end with this. My goal alongside with Love Life is to get 100 full-time Love Life missionaries by the end of 2022. And we're working on a big pro-life conference for the church. We're working on a big idea right now, trying to rally some very important partnerships to make this happen. The goal for that would be January of 2022. But in the meantime, we're trying to get more missionaries now. And we want the January 2022 big event to be an a catalyst to tenfold that goal. So by the end of January 2022, we have 100 full-time Love Life missionaries. And guess what? We already have 10 in the state of California. Because with Chino Hills, one in Fresno, and three in Antioch, which is about um, an hour outside of Sacramento, that's 10 already. So we have a Northern California presence. We have a Chino Hills, Southern California presence. We need one in, uh, here, and then, and then we'll build out from there. So I think this is a doable goal. I think having a huge pro-life church conference in January of 2022 will be a huge catalyst towards that. And if we accomplish that, we could change the spiritual climate of the state in incredible ways and take back spiritual ground. So that's how this fits into the California vision. That's what we're actually aiming for. So you're playing a big part in a bigger picture of what we want to do here. So I'll conclude with this and then I'll hang around for any questions that you have. We're not going to do a formal Q&A time like all of us together because I want to respect your time and get some of you home, but I'm, I'm going to hang out here. And so if you do have questions and want to talk, come up afterwards. But I want, I want to end with this and, and Josh mentioned this in the beginning and you may have heard me reference this before, um, but I think it's just, I think it bears repeating. I think it's powerful because many pastors, they preach out of this passage and then they will never apply it to the issue of abortion. And I just find that so disturbing because while you can apply this verse and passage to pretty much anything, amen, there is no other class of human beings today who is being killed at the tune of a million a year. And there is no other class of human beings today that it is legal to kill. <laughs> That's only preborn image bearers who dwell in a womb that our Savior once entered human history in. So from Luke 10, you guys, and behold, a lawyer stood up to put Jesus to the test saying, teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It's an important question. How do I get to heaven? And Jesus answered and said, uh, what is written in the law and how do you read it? And the lawyer nails to the answer. Remember, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourself. Boom. And Jesus says, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. By the way, it's kind of nice to have God tell you your theology is correct. <laughs> You have answered correctly. Epic. I know my Bible, God. You know what's sobering about that is that's the majority of pastors in America today. Tim Keller, Andy Stanley, John Piper, and many others. Russell Moore, who will say, I know the law. To love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus says, all the law and the commandments hang on these two. And that was it, right? No. And he said, seeking to justify himself. And who is my neighbor? Now, listen, the lawyer knew who his neighbor was, you guys. Because he had the theological brilliance to summarize all the law and the prophets into two in the stroke of theological brilliance and have God tell him his orthodoxy is right. But his orthopraxy was crap. He was trying to create categories of neighbor and non-neighbor in order to shirk himself of his responsibility of loving the neighbors that he didn't want to. But what was the first question he asked Christ? What must I do to inherit eternal life? So he's trying to figure out how he can get into heaven and still hate certain people. Wow. And he is my neighbor. What an offensive question to ask God, by the way. 
You see, the lawyer knew that every human being was his neighbor, but he was trying to find a justification to avoid loving those either that he didn't like or that were inconvenient to love. The way that this applies to abortion is that there is no other class of human beings alive today to whom the question is more frequently directed, are they really neighbors? than pre-born image bearers. And that assumption, that seeping assumption and question, like, are they really neighbors though, God? That question is usually coming from American pulpits by pastors who say they're pro-life and they have the right orthodoxy, but they say that the unborn is not intrinsically valuable enough to warrant political protection or to warrant my presence outside of the mill that I walk by on the other side of the road or drive by on my way to prep my sermon in my office on Saturday night. Just like the Levite and the priest. In response to who is my neighbor, Jesus tells this parable. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road. You could call him a pastor. And when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers to the bleeding victim? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. There is no greater class. There is no greater bleeding victim alive today than the preborn. There are many other bleeding victims and we should support all of the justice and mercy causes that are aimed at their protection. But there is no greater class of bleeding victims alive today than the preborn. And they're the only class of human beings that it's legal to kill and whose deaths you fund with your tax dollars. And thanks to this administration, you're now funding abortions overseas again, ladies and gentlemen. The Samaritan was the bleeding victim's natural enemy because Jews and Samaritans hated one another. But unlike the pastor who was probably anti-street mugging, another way to say that is I'm personally pro-life. I would never get an abortion, but when I see a bleeding victim on the side of the road, I go out of my way to walk by on the other side of the road. The Levite and the priest were probably anti-street mugging, but when they saw someone who was mugged and half dead, they went out of their way to avoid loving him because that, that victim didn't fit the category of neighbor. Like the preborn doesn't fit the category of neighbor to most woke pastors and congregations today. We are simply called to be the good Samaritan to our bleeding victims today. And the deeper spiritual truth that ought to light a theological fire under our butts is this. We are not the good Samaritan in that parable. We are the bleeding victims on the side of the road, bleeding out in our sin because of our choices and defiance of God and our love of sin more than Christ. Christ is the greater good Samaritan who, when he sees us on the side of the road, has compassion and love on us, embraces us, shows us the way back to eternity. If we would merely repent of our sins and turn to him. So we seek to save preborn image bearers and love their mothers and fathers, not to earn God's love. We do it because we already have God's love. The correct response of the heart to abortion is to simply love these children and love their mothers and fathers because we have been rescued from eternal death and damnation. So how could we not rescue preborn children from immediate physical death? Speak up for those who cannot speak for themselves. We are those who cannot speak up for ourselves. But first John says, Christ is our advocate who pleads our case before the father. An advocate is someone who speaks up for someone else. We're simply called to be that for children because Christ has been that for us. That's our calling. And that's been the church's calling for a long time. And the tragedy is the very pastors who are silent on abortion today are the same pastors who critique the silence of Christians on slavery in 1850 and the silence of Germans on the Holocaust in 1940. And we haven't learned our lesson. And the church is arguably more silent on abortion 
than we were on those atrocities. But they're wrong for the same reason, because they dehumanize image bearers of God while seeking to justify their mistreatment through euphemistic bigotry and political correctness. We have the truth. We have the light because we know where truth comes from and we know who knits these children together. This is your calling. This is our calling. When one family stands, when one person stands, when one pastor stands, everything changes. What happens if 130 people stand in this state and begin taking back spiritual ground, developing our witness and simply being obedient to Christ? He will open up the floodgates of heaven, give us more blessings than we know what to do with. Hear our pleas for mercy and heal this land. And our land is in more need of healing now than it's been in a long time. So let's close in prayer. Thank you guys for coming out. Feel free to stick around for questions. And I believe this is a kerosene moment on a small flame that will erupt into a wildfire to use a a horrific analogy for this area um, to take back spiritual ground um, that will lead to political change in a way that we have never seen before. Father, thank you for, um, for being the greatest preborn child. Thank you for allowing yourself to be knit together by yourself in a womb that you once knit together to redeem mankind from their sins. Thank you for identifying with us because we have a high priest who um, can identify with our weaknesses and was tested every way that we were yet without sin. But you identified with us at the prenatal stage, at the zygote stage where you say we were an eternal soul created in your image. So give us gratitude and thankfulness for the lives that you've given us and humility to protect the lives of children who don't even have the right to be born. The Holocaust on this country as the sewers of America run red with the blood of children that our tax dollars are funding and that our pastors are allowing. So thank you for Rob. Thank you for Rick. Thank you for the 130 people here tonight who are obedient and want to see what you will do when your people respond. We pray for those who've been wounded by abortion in the city and in this church, that you would heal them, that they would experience restoration and forgiveness and that you would use them mightily. We pray for the faithfulness of people who will stand outside of abortion centers, that lives would be changed, that women would respond to the love of the church. We pray for prayer and worship outside of these places of death, that they would be shut down and that the people working inside would be so convicted and nauseated as they're working there that they would walk out and embrace us. Help us to memorize and know these people's names who work at these centers to pray for them, to help them get other jobs, to offer to get them employment, to leave this disgusting, blood-soaked industry. And help us to apply the salve of the gospel to those who have been wounded by abortion, to raise them up as leaders in a, uh, a tidal wave that would change this country forever. We thank you for winning our hearts for life, for forgiving us of our sins, for dying for us, for letting yourself be aborted, abused, killed, on our behalf so that we could have our sins forgiven. We repent corporately and individually for allowing this travesty in this country, in this community, in this county, and in this state to wake up your church and use the the small and the brave here to make a a massive change. Um, we, We really have no comprehension of what you can do Um, when your people respond and we're excited to see what you'll do. Um, So equip us, strengthen us, protect us from the forces of darkness and from those um, who would target us for our obedience and uh, commitment to righteousness. And we pray that this would just be the small beginning of what you're going to do here at God's Speak, here in Thousand Oaks, here in this county and here in this state. We thank you for the brothers and sisters here who have been contending for life far long before I got here and for the individuals who have come alongside us and what we're building here. We pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Well, thank you guys so much for staying tuned in to this special episode. I hope it blessed you. It's a very different episode than I know what you're accustomed to on this show, but it gives you a local window into what I'm doing um, during the week to build this ministry at our new local church with the support of our pastor and congregation and individuals who know that their role is to adopt a certain level of personal responsibility in their own lives to end abortion. And so we're just building volunteers and foot soldiers and people who are going to help women and men heal from abortion, prevent women from making that mistake before 
before they do to pray for this city, to put a Christian witness outside every abortion center, and to be mentor families to individuals who are so low in their life that they're rationalizing killing their own child. This is what we're building here. So if you want to do this in your city, in your town, go to lovelife.org forward slash America. That's lovelife.org forward slash America, and we're going to get you connected with people there locally or equip and train and disciple you up to be that local connection there to build foot soldiers, volunteers, and church partners so that we can accomplish putting a Christian witness outside every abortion clinic in the country. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to learn more, head on over to sethgruber.com, S-E-T-H-G-R-U-B as in baby boy, E-R.com to sign up for my newsletter, to view training videos, more information, um, as well as to view my speaking schedule if you want to hear me speak live and local. We appreciate Appreciate your support. Go subscribe at YouTube, Spotify, iTunes podcast. Leave us a rating and review. We really appreciate it. And until next week, I'm Seth Gruber, and this is Unaborted.